This is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News. Republicans in Congress are ramping up their assault on climate science and seem determined to undo decades of regulations that are designed to protect the environment. Part of the Republican strategy seems to be the censor of the scientific community. All around the world, we are seeing a proliferation and intensification of extreme weather events. The increase in the frequency and severity of extreme events, such as hurricanes and floods, has been linked to climate change. And another potentially disastrous, but less abrupt effect of climate change is increased sea level rise. Our next guest was among the, amongst the first to alert the public to the growing risk of a trillion dollar housing crash in US coastal areas. We are joined today by Dr. Joe Rome, who is the founding editor of Climate Progress. He is chief science advisor for the Emmy winning TV series, Years of Living Dangerously, and the author of nine books, most recently, Climate Change, What Everyone Needs to Know. He is also the author of the recent article, Rapid Arctic Ice Melt Sets the Stage for Economic Disaster Under Trump. Thank you for joining us today, Joe. Thanks for having me. Last week, Joe, The Real News interviewed Dr. David Barber, a leading climate scientist, and among other things, he explained that the massive Greenland ice sheet is melting 600% faster than predicted by climate models. And in December of 2015, the global community came together to conclude a, Paris, a, a climate accord in Paris, France, and it established two degrees Celsius as the maximum temperature increase that the global community should tolerate. It set an aspirational target of 1.5 degrees Celsius, but the emission reduction targets which the participant nations brought to the table are not sufficient to keep the global temperature increase to less than two degrees Celsius, let alone 1.5 degrees, and could result in an increase well in excess of three degrees Celsius. And Joe, if, if the countries that signed on to the Paris Accord meet those emission reduction targets but do not exceed them, what kind of sea level rise can we anticipate uh, by 2100 within this century? Well, if the nations of the world simply stop, they don't continue ratcheting down uh, emissions, if, and, you know, if Donald Trump is successful, let's say, in killing the Paris climate negotiations, which are ongoing, um, to make deeper and deeper cuts, then you know, uh, I think most leading climate uh, scientists and, and particularly the glaciologists, sea level rise, rise experts would say, you know, we're looking at four or five or six feet of sea level rise by the end of the century, and it will just keep rising after that. And, and that is, you know, not even counting the, the storm surges that we get from Hurricane Sandy type storms, which are also becoming more common. And at a, at a sea level rise of that magnitude, what parts of the uh, coastal regions of the United States would be most affected in your view? Well, you know, the, the most vulnerable from the point of being the most valuable real estate uh, that is subject to inundation for that level sea level rise is South Florida. And we're talking about the, all of Miami, the you know the greater Miami area, going up to Fort, Fort Lauderdale, and and um, so if you've been down there, then you know see, the the city is right there, you know, just a foot two above sea level, and South Florida itself is exceedingly shallow, which is why there's so much swampland there. So um, you know, we're we're that would be hundreds of billions of dollars worth of real estate that would be would be subject to inundation. You also have the city of New Orleans, which is to a great extent underwater, as people I think learned during uh, Hurricane Katrina. And the more sea level rises, the more difficult it is to hold back the you know the sea. Uh, using levees and the like, and the more vulnerable the city is to a big hurricane. Uh, other places that are vulnerable are, you know, the Boston area, the the Carolina coastline, Kitty Hawk type area, but also going over to, um, you know, Galveston, Texas, and 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 Houston, and so the east and southeast coasts, those are especially vulnerable. As you start to get up to six feet of sea level rise, though, you're also, you know, endangering Seattle, San Francisco, and, and the West Coast. Mm -hmm. and, and at that level of sea level rise, and let's just focus in on one market, because obviously there are distinctive characteristics to each of these markets that you've mentioned. Let's focus on the most exposed, the Miami, Miami area. If we experience in the range of four to six feet of sea level rise, what impact do you expect that to have on the real estate market in Miami? 
Well, Miami can't survive. Could, could simply, as we know it today, would would simply not exist. Um, and the question of when the real estate market would collapse. I mean, as, as you know. Uh, uh, the Miami real estate market has been very, very hot, and forty million dollar condos and 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 all of that. People investing almost literally as if there's no tomorrow. And uh, on years of living dangerously, you know, in our second episode, we sent Jack Black down uh, to Miami to talk to scientists, to talk to real estate experts, to talk to a real estate broker, and yeah, I, I think when you go to to four to f- six feet then you are talking about the exodus from from South Florida. Because the, the thing to remember is that, again, sea levels don't just rise four to six feet and stop. They keep rising a foot a decade after that. So uh, that's why the real estate market is, is in danger long before sea levels get to that point. The, the, the real estate market, which I wrote about on Climate Progress, and in my book, Climate Change, What Everyone Needs to Know, that starts to get hurt just when people start to think sea level rise and increased storm surge are going to be very hard to avoid. And there is already preliminary evidence for, uh, that was discussed in the New York Times, it's been discussed on, on uh, the website of Fannie Mae, that co- the properties that are more subjected, subjected to coastal flooding uh, are already seeing property values rising much slower than other types of property. So, you know, I think people should be quite worried if they have coastal property investment, if they know someone who does, if they're thinking of it, uh, that, that just sometime over the next decade, 15 years, something serious is going to happen to the coastal property market, and that bubble of overvalued coastal property is roughly, uh, you know, a trillion dollars. And, and, you know, classical economics would have us believe that investors are, you know, rational maximizers of their self-interest. You know, given the, the breadth and the, 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 the just the, the power of the scientific consensus around climate change and the way global governments are behaving in particularly, uh, you know, the, 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 the ascendancy of the Trump administration, its hostility to the climate science community, one would think that rational investors would, right now, as we speak, be ratcheting down dramatically their valuation of these properties. How do you explain the fact, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, some of the real estate, its value is growing more slowly, but there doesn't seem to be in the marketplace, even in South Florida, an appreciation of the dangers that are at hand. And how do you explain that in terms of the psychology of these investors? And is that even consistent with the notion that investors are rational maximizers of their self-interest? Yeah, well, you know, look, I think that, uh, you know, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow and wrote, won the Nobel Prize in, in economics for his work pretty much showing that people aren't, aren't rational, uh, you know, I don't think there's any any evidence that the that the housing market has been rational. You only have to go back ten years to to see what happened when the entire economic financial chain overvalued the housing market, and we had the you know the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. You know, we do, as you said, live in a time where the president of the United States, the governor of Florida, keep denying the existence of climate change. Uh, you know, to answer your question, I am quite certain that the smart money is already reevaluating and not putting more money in. And, and it is this issue of whether, you know, and the reason I wrote the book, Climate Change, What Everyone Needs to Know, is we're going to have the smart money and then we're going to have everyone else. And ultimately, it is very hard to time any market. I just want to be very clear on that. I can't tell you when the collapse is going to come. All I can do is tell you that the existing market is like a trillion dollars overpriced because uh, that's how much uh, the National Flood Insurance Program is insuring U.S. coastal property for, which is like triple the amount uh, that it was just uh, you know a decade or two ago. So. 
we are literally inflating artificially the price of coastal property. That is not tenable. That cannot keep going. And like I said, if we have, if we had a Hurricane Sandy hit Miami, we would be looking at fifty to one hundred billion dollars in insured property losses, and and all of the insurers in the state of Florida and the state itself would declare bankruptcy, and you and I would all have to bail them out. Uh, so, you know. The future is it's pretty clear what's going to happen. What I just can't tell you is when it's going to happen. And I think people have to make a decision for themselves what their level of risk tolerance is. You know, according to the experts I've talked to and according to the, you know, the Years of Living Dangerously TV series, which, which people can, you know, watch at, at the Years of Living Dangerously website, is that a lot of this investment is from foreigners trying to pull their money out of other countries. So you have Russian investors and you have Chinese investors and they they see coastal property in Miami as like oh a great place to put money and they don't think a lot about climate change because they're, you know, super rich and this is just one investment among many. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you talked a little bit about the safety net that's in place. You mentioned uh, insurance and also you touched upon government and forms of insurance. What what is the level of safety that net that is in place for coastal regions, for example, the one most exposed, South Florida? And, uh, you know, to what is it adequate? Is it even remotely adequate to make up the losses that would be experienced in, uh, you know, the, some, some of the more dire scenarios? Well, I won't surprise you to know that the money needed for the actual paying off of damages in the event of, you know, a Hurricane Sandy-like storm hitting South Florida, that money isn't sitting there. It is the good faith and credit of everybody listening, of the federal government, which is backed by, you know, the taxpayers. So uh, if there were such a disaster, and, and obviously such disaster is pretty inevitable, I just can't tell you when it's going to happen, then uh, you, the taxpayers would have to bail out all of the people who were providing, you know, uh, who were insured, who had their property insured through the National Flood Insurance Program. And, you know, this is this would be a stunning economic shock to the United States. I think it would clearly send the signal that we can't keep insuring property that is increasingly going to be subject to more storm surge and higher sea level rise. So, you know, we are currently in, you can call it a Ponzi scheme, a bubble, whatever you want to call it. What we're doing now can't be sustained. Um, it won't be the way we're doing things 25 years from now. Sometime between now and then, we're going to see a radical shift and, and you simply won't be able to get insurance for coastal property. I mean, right now, banks are starting to rethink this whole issue of should I write a 30-year mortgage for a, a, a house that might be underwater. So, you know, this is really, it's just been in the last few years that we've learned how much faster Greenland and Antarctica are disintegrating than we thought, coupled with, you know, uh, with the election of Trump, uh, a recognition that maybe the world isn't going to act fast enough. Uh, what the agreement that you talked about in Paris, that was the first time the entire world got together and made commitments just through the year, you know, 2025, 2030. But that agreement said we need to keep coming back every five years and coming ratcheting down the world the commitment of the world's leading nations if you know donald trump says we're not per united states the second biggest polluter is not participating and if vladimir putin who is the fifth biggest polluter says hey we're not participating either and then you know the whole negotiation process could fall apart and in that case the notion that we might avert these worst case scenarios is going to disappear. You know, the best case scenario, I don't want to, you know, just be uh, talking about the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is the nations of the world continue ratcheting down pollution and we ultimately might only warm, as you say, below two degrees Celsius. And then sea level rise is going to be 
much less, and it's also going to be much slower. And I'm not saying we can still avoid uh, serious harm, but we'd have more time to deal with it, and it would be in, in a more measured pace. Uh, and, and, you know, as someone who was acting assistant secretary of energy for energy efficiency and renewable energy, I'm very blown away by the, the speed in which solar power and wind power and electric cars and advanced batteries and LED lights have been entering the marketplace. So if the world wants to avoid catastrophe, the technologies are here. But, you know, if the Trump administration, which is, you know, Donald Trump is a someone who's denied the reality of climate science. He has filled his staff and cabinet with people who deny the reality of climate change. He says he's going to, you know, spur the use of oil and coal, which are the, you know, principal contributors to carbon pollution. Uh, if that happens, then, you know, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to be in the best case scenario and we'll be back headed towards the worst case scenario. Well, it's, it's clear that the solutions are there and that there is a disconnect between uh, the attitudes of the policymakers and the science. That's exactly why we at The Real News uh, have, are in the process of creating a climate change bureau, uh, Great. Which, is, which we are going to be dedicating uh, very considerable resources in the future with the help of our viewers. And I hope we'll have you back on, Joe, uh, to monitor the uh, progress of, uh, of uh, the fight against the climate crisis. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Eric, for having me. And this is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News.